Alright, here we go. We're on there live. A lot of, a lot of voices crack. I heard that. Voices crack. I hope you saw it. Good stuff. Mine was cracking. Now I was just cracking. Alright, let's hold up in prayer. Heavenly Father God, uh, Father, we thank you for this time that you set aside for us to hear from your word, the Bible. I ask you, God, to use me as a clean vessel and to open up the hearts and minds of all of us here. Give us wisdom and discernment. And Father, help us not only to just hear this message, but to do the message and to help us understand how we apply it to our lives and walk it out. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. And uh, today's message... Yeah, that's a bottle of water. <laughs> today's message is peacekeeper. Peacekeeper, not beekeeper, right? And not a peacekeeper like uh, Dirty Harry, right? Dirty Harry, right? The big gun. That's what I used to think when I thought of peacekeeper. They should have a big gun, big Glock or something, right? But we're not talking about that today. What we are talking about, we're going to take a look at what the Bible says about being a peacekeeper, how that how that fits into all of our relationships. And, and what the expectations are of God for us. Alright, and so the first scripture that we look at is in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. And it says, Blessed are the peacekeepers, for they will be called the children of God. That's Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. So we need to be keeping peace. I, I'm going to tell you right now, i got pages on all kinds of stuff here because this is a. It sounds like a pretty simple message, right? Just keep the peace, you know, peace, everyone, and we're, <coughs> and we're all set. But that's not the situation here. And, and, and the more I went into this message, the more I started to see the different sides of, of all of this. And we're going to try to cover as much as I can of it today. So, so that, that scripture that I just put out there, I'm going to be putting a lot of scriptures out there. So you can either just write them down and go look at them later or try to find them. But, but Matthew is in the Gospels. It's, it's pretty much, uh, i say, it's the first book of the New Testament. And so it's, you get to the halfway point, you start going towards the end, you'll see the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 5. So most importantly, we need to be keeping the peace with each other. Right, so all of us here, we're all members, you know, we're all in recovery, we're all members of one fellowship or another, and it's important that we're keeping the peace with each other. Imagine what it looks like when we don't keep the peace, right? We don't, we don't even have to imagine that because it happens all the time. Right? We get into arguments, certain people don't like certain people, or, you know, maybe just for today they don't like each other, so there's like a little bit of a spat, right? And, and now people are separated and all this stuff. But what's that look like to the newcomer coming into the door? When they're seeking recovery, when they're, when they're destroyed from the streets and the things that they've gone through, and they come into an environment where there's no peace, right? Or an environment where there's constant strife, people are gossiping, people are talking crap, and all this other stuff. Remember, we covered, covered the message a few weeks ago on gossiping and the dangers of that, right? And so it's important, it's vital for us to keep the peace amongst ourselves, and there has to be some kind of structure with that too, right? Because if we don't have a structure, to go by in the recovery process, we're not going to have a lot of peace, right? We, we need to be carrying the same message to the newcomer, helping people the same way, right? Talking the same way, presenting things the same way. Like, I can't be in a 12-step program and turn around and try to teach people about, you know, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, right? I, that's not that's not how it works. It, that doesn't mean cognitive behavioral therapy is going to help somebody. Of course it is, but it's not the place for it, right? So we need that structure, and God and His Word has structure as well. Psalms one thirty three verse one says this: it "says How pleasant it is for brothers for brethren to dwell together in unity." So we have to have unity amongst ourselves. So as Christians, we have to have unity. And we have to have structure. We have to have the same message when we're carrying the gospel to other people. We have to understand God or else, if we don't understand God and His Word, we're carrying a false message. Right? So if we have, if, if, I'm, if I'm not going out of God's Word and I'm just putting my own spin on things or I'm misinterpreting it, I'm carrying a false message and I'm confusing people. And remember last week we were talking about how, how the enemy 
uses false apostles <coughs> to further his agenda. So the structure in God's word, we're going to take a look at a couple of Proverbs just to kind of get a little bit more of an understanding of this. So we're going to go to Proverbs 17, verse 17. Proverbs 17, verse 17, and it says, A friend, a friend loved at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. A brother is born for adversity. So if a friend loves at all times, a brother is born for adversity. So we need to be loving towards each other. Proverbs 18, 22 says, A man that hath friends must show himself also friendly, and there is a friend that sticks closer to a brother. So we have to be supporting and loving each other. I think a lot of us already understand that. There's a ton of love in our community. We're all looking out for each other, right? We're all trying to do right by each other. But we also need to be striving towards peace with each other, too. Right? Hebrews 31, 1 says, Let brotherly love continue. And be not forget and be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels. So the Bible's telling us at times too, you ever ran into somebody and they and they're not like you and they're kind of maybe they're a little weird, you might think they're a little weird or something. And so, you know, they're coming up to you and you're all like, you know, the Bible's telling you to be friendly to these people. Right? God's telling us to be friendly. Right? To entertain says sometimes you might be entertaining an angel, you don't even know it. Right? We don't you don't know who God sent in our path. Right? We gotta keep this stuff up front in our minds. Proverbs 24, 17 and 18 says this. Check this out. It says, rejoice not when your enemy falls. Right? Don't, don't be all happy when your enemy falls, right? Because he goes on and says this. Let not your heart be glad when he stumbles. Verse 18 says, Let the Lord, lest the Lord see it, and it displease him, and he turn away his wrath from him. And turns it on to you. Right? So when you see someone you don't like them or something, and they get all jammed up in a situation, and you're like, oh yeah. Right? They got them. God's saying, listen, don't let God, don't let me see that. Because I'll turn my wrath off of this person and, and wham, you're dead. Right? Don't have bitterness and envy and all that stuff in our hearts, right? This is what the Bible is teaching us to do. Luke 9, 23, Jesus says, listen, if you want to follow me, you need to deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me daily. Daily. It's a day to time process. We can't just say, oh, I'm, I'm following Jesus from now on and I'm locked in for life. We've been covering this in our messages. That's nonsense. You need to be committing to this daily, on a daily basis, just like we do in our recovery. I don't come into to, uh, you know, an NA meeting and say, okay, I'm a member of NA, because you guys said I am what I say I am, right? When I have the desire to stop using, and then that's it. I'm golden, right? It doesn't work like that. It doesn't even make sense. Now the real work begins. You come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, you accept Him as your Lord and Savior, guess what? Now the work begins. Now the transformation starts happening. Right? Now I'm going to stop living a little bit differently because now I'm saying that I'm, that I'm together with Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, listen, you can't be claiming my name saying, Lord, 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 and not doing the things that I say to do. Mm -hmm. That's craziness, right? Remember, we go back to Matthew 7 all the time, but we need to understand it. Because in Matthew 7, he says, listen, people are going to come to him and say, Lord, didn't we do this? Lord, didn't we do that? Lord, didn't we? Listen, these are people that are professing to know Jesus. These aren't people that said, oh, I never knew Jesus, who cares, right? No, these are people who are like, Didn't, Lord, weren't we saying this? Weren't we doing this? He said, negative, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. And remember, iniquity means lawlessness. So you are not going by the structure of what God had laid out. And Jesus says, you got to go. I never knew you. He says, he that does the will of my Father. So we need to be doing the will of the Father. And guess what? Having peace is part of doing the will of the Father. That's why I put some emphasis on this today. So, so we've been looking also at loving our neighbors, right? Loving God, which is Jesus summarizing the commandments. Paul goes on to explain that a little bit later. That love fulfill the law. Right? So there is a law. We know this. It hasn't, it hasn't vanished away. Certain parts of the Old Testament have been moved out of the way, right? Ceremonial system, which pointed to Jesus Christ. The civil laws, which was a witness against us, which was put on the side of the Ark of the Covenant for a witness against us, right? That's us been pushed out of the way. We use that, though, the spiritual applications of that. We talked about that a couple weeks ago, where we talked about don't muzzle the ox, right? Remember I asked, does anyone own an ox in here? 
<laughs> Anyone go out and buy an ox and stuff? Not yet. No? You did? It's probably good. <laughs> you don't have the lawnmower anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and when he's out treading the corn, make sure you don't muzzle him. But there was a law in the Old Testament. It said, don't muzzle your ox. And Paul talks about it later on. Right? There was a principle. Because people didn't have love. They didn't have love in the house. They didn't love their animals. So what they did is they were just greedy. They said, I'm going to put a muzzle on this animal. Then he's going to go over here and work for me. But I'm not going to let him eat of his own labor. So they had it. So, so God said, here's a witness against them. Put that in the law book. Because the people are being greedy. So Paul goes on to talk about it later on in the New Testament. He says, listen, as you've heard it said, don't muzzle the ox. Talking about giving a man his fair, his fair wages for the things that he's doing. Like, don't be a cheapskate. You gotta have someone working for you. Pay that person, right? So there's principles from the from the law that, that from the book of Moses' law that we apply to our lives. And then we have the Ten Commandments of God, which is still in effect. And Jesus summarizes that. He says, "We love God first. We're all about heart and all about might, right? And then we do the same unto our neighbor." So we know that we've been looking at that. <coughs> We cannot say, right? First John says this, and we, we talked about this last week too. You can't be saying, oh, you know, I, I love God, right? And turn around and hate your neighbor. Hate your brother. The Bible says you're a liar. It says, how can you say that you love God who you've not seen and hate your brother who you've seen? It says, you're a liar. Revelation 21 says, listen, all liars have their part in the lake of fire. I believe that stuff, man. Like I said, I am not trying to go take a swim out there. Better than up, fuck lakes, you know? So are we keeping the peace though? Like kind of coming back to this, are we keeping the peace when we when we gossip about people? No. We're sitting there talking, even if it's true. Oh, I've seen someone tell. Right? We, that happens so often, doesn't it? We're all guilty of it. Oh, you see what such and such did? Who do they think they are, right? Hey, always got something to say about somebody. Listen, that is not great in the eyes of God. It's not. So we got to take a look at that. Exodus 20, verse 9. That's, that's, that's saying don't have false witness against your neighbor. Listen, that's a, that's, a, that's a commandment from God. That's one of the commandments. We're not supposed to have false witness against our neighbors. James 4, 11 through 12 says, Speak no evil about us. Proverbs 19, 5 says, the false witnesses will not go unpunished. Will not go unpunished. So remember when we was talking about, oh, you seen so-and-so tricking me all. I don't like so-and-so anyway. They got all the eye coming to him, right? And all of a sudden, God says, hold on a second. He's over here dealing with so-and-so. He says, wait a minute. What's he doing? Right? You think it's okay when this happens? So, so the Bible is pretty, you know, God is, is pretty uh, on point when it comes to this stuff, right? Because, because when we look at it like this, right? If we look at it from a recovery context, which is what the church is, right? You have a group of us that are in recovery, and if, and if people, if someone's trying to get clean, right? They're on the outside of this, right? Someone's struggling with the disease, and they pop up into a meeting, and the disease got them in the grips, right? Remember when we were caught in the grips, and it was like everyone's lying, you, you guys aren't really clean, you can't be clean, right? A lot of us thought all this kind of stuff. And we come into a meeting and we're watching people gossip and backbite and argue and like all this stuff. Hey, the message is confusing, right? I come into the place and one person saying this, another person saying that, right? You know, we got this guy, so like I use an example. One guy's talking about the 12 steps, someone else is talking about three principles, someone else is talking about this and that. And, and we're like, what the heck is going on? Man? You know what I mean? I'm trying to come in here for a solution, and these people are crazier than the people I was running around the street. <laughs> you know? I'm just going to go back out and use. Like, these people are nuts. <laughs> this is what happens in the church. This is what happens in the so-called churches. You have some, some Christians that walk around, and they want to just shoot lightning bolts down at you, right? For, because they're looking down on you. And then some people just say, oh, it's okay. Don't worry about it. God doesn't care. What do you mean God doesn't care? Right? God just told me, he said, listen, if you're looking at somebody else and thinking all the good they got him, he's like, I'm going to get you. He's like, you better be acting right, right? God has structure. And we have to find that balance in this. Right? Which, which, is, which is, listen, God wants us to have peace. Peace within ourselves, peace with his word, and peace with each other. So if someone now, now flip it around, right, and thank God we have this in this community, so when someone comes walking into a meeting, they see the structure. They see the unity, 
right? They get to see the love and the, and the togetherness, right? When we all get together and we gather and we, and we have these little, you know, get-togethers or whatever, and, and, and people get to see that, it's welcoming, right? They want to be a part of it. We're not all talking like, yeah, some of us go to different fellowships and stuff like this, but when we're part of those fellowships, we're, we're acting as, you know, according with those programs, right? So, and I'm not saying, like, don't go to 3P or whatever, like, if anyone's here or not, that's not what I'm saying. Like, if you're at a 3P meeting, talk about the 3Ps, right? If you're coming to a 12-step meeting, let's talk about the 12 steps, right? If I'm coming to a, 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 a mosque, we're going to talk about, you know, whatever. We're going to talk about the Quran, right? We're not going to be talking about some other stuff. If I come to a church, a, a, a Christ-centered, Bible-based church, I want to hear about Jesus Christ. I want to hear about His Word of the Bible. I don't want to hear about all these other stuff. Mm -hmm. So why do we think it's so hard for us to keep the peace sometimes? This message didn't come out by accident, by the way. I was working on this a few weeks ago. And I uh, put it away. That's why it's way back in the notebook. I showed Erica. And, I was, and, and then another thing, and then my God just hit me with another message. I was like, all right, I'm going to talk about this instead. All right? And then this past week, some stuff came up. And, you know, I had to make some decisions in, in my own situation. Right? I had to make a decision. Do I want to, like, live in peace? Or do I want to hold on to this anger? Because, listen, the anger and the resentment, like we say around here, is like drinking a poison and waiting for the other person to die. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? So, filled up with anger. And, listen, the enemy... Who's walking around like a roaring lion? First, first Peter five and eight talks about that. And remember what that verse says. It says, "Be you sober." It's not a. Be you sober and vigilant. It says, "Be sober and vigilant." How often do we hear that in meetings and recovery? Right? You gotta stay sober, and you gotta stay vigilant because the disease is creeping around any corner, waiting to catch you up. Well, the Bible in 1 Peter 5, 8 says the enemy, your enemy, your adversary, right? Satan is walking around as a roaring lion looking for whom he can devour. He's looking to tear us up. He doesn't want us to have anything to do with Jesus Christ. He doesn't want us to have anything to do with recovery or none of that stuff, right? So what happens is this stuff starts working on our pride. It starts working on our egos. We start work, you know, and what happens is we get into this fear-based state Right, well, we have to protect ourselves. We were talking about this last week. And remember, the opposite of fear is having faith. So we're confronted with a situation, and, if it, and Satan can work through and be like, oh, well, who do they think they are? You know what I mean? And, and you're justified to have that anger. You should be mad about that thing. You should be doing this and that. And we're going to cover a little bit of this in the, in the Bible today, because listen, God does teach us to set some boundaries in our lives. Don't get that twisted, we're going to cover it, right? He teaches us to keep some boundaries and to be and to be following Him, right? And to be separate from the world and not tolerate the nonsense. But He also teaches us to do it in peace. So how do we find that balance, right? If I'm not living in faith and I'm not seeking God and I'm not examining myself like 2 uh, Corinthians 13.5 says to do, right? It says to examine yourself to make sure that you're in the faith. That way I'm not in the fear. When I'm in the fear, I feel like I have to self-protect myself. I have to, I have to guard everything, right? Oh, you, you, you hurt, you hurt my pride, you hurt my feelings, and so now I respond negatively. And God's saying, no, respond in peace. So sometimes we gotta practice humility and love and wisdom and discernment and seek many counsels, as the Bible says, to figure out what is right and wrong. And for those of us that are in recovery, we understand this stuff. Because we have a program that tells you to go get a sponsor, right? Go surround yourself with the winners, right? Go be in the solution, man. You know, you got some stuff going on in your life, man. I don't know what to do. What does the program tell us? Do nothing. Do nothing. So if you don't know what to do, don't do nothing. Because odds are, if you're like me, you can do the wrong thing. You are going to have a boss. And then guess what? You got to come back and say, so you're, you're going to have to work that tent stuff and own some stuff. So rather than do all that, just hold your peace. Just don't do nothing. Pray. God, help me. And remember, God's not going to, God, most likely, God's not going to come down a cloud and stand there next to me and say, well, Pete, you know, why do you think you're upset? You know? Why is this bothering you? Let's take a look at this. You just, that's not how it's going to work. Say God's going to work through somebody else. 
if I allow the process to happen. Right. But I have to be open. And I have to be willing. And I have to surround myself with other believers. Because I can surround myself with, with, with a bunch of knuckleheads. That's comfortable for me. It used to be. It's not now. But back in the day, it was comfortable. You know, so I get around a bunch of other dudes who are living how I was living, or women who were living how I was living, and thought how I was living, and I knew who would co-sign it. Right? I knew who would say, oh yeah, no, you should do that. Let them have it. You know what I mean? <laughs> hey, and then we're all going for a swim together. So we know, we know who's going to co-sign who isn't. We know the people that are living spiritually and, and, and living Christ-like that are going to tell us, that they're going to talk to us, that they're going to minister to us. And listen, I'll tell you this. I love when people pray with me and, and these kinds of things, but I also like when we get to the root cause. I like when we get into the exact nature and see what's going on here. Right? Why are we acting like this? Why are you living in fear? Listen, why are you having such a hard time turning your will and your life over? Why are you having a hard time living in faith? Don't you know God got you? Look what he's done for you already. You know, but we, I know for me, I need to hear that stuff. Right? And that means I need to risk being vulnerable and talk to some people. The Bible tells me to do that. If I'm not examining myself, I'm in trouble. Deep trouble. We've got to continue to examine ourselves. Now we're talking about a little bit about people like outside of ourselves. Right? Like, it's easy for me to try to think about this like the people that are out there still using, right? Do the people that are out there still using, do we walk around and do we say, Ah, oh, pieces of crap. You know? Those pieces of crap, they just burn. Walk them out. Losers. Scumbags. Do we do that as the covering addicts? You know what I mean? No. We have empathy for them. Mm -hmm. Listen, we see someone we know, or someone we don't know, and they're out there struggling. Listen, sometimes we're away, we go away, and we're, we're like, at a, you know, we're, we're down in like a beach community, and you see somebody, and they're banged up. Banged up. Real bad. The disease got them in the grips, right? Suffering. And we look at them and we're like, man, dude, that is rocking. You know what I mean? It's like we have empathy for that person because they're struggling. They're struggling, man. They're in pain. They're doing the things they don't want to do, most likely, right? They're living out there. They don't want to keep using like that. They're abandoned. They probably got children at home. They probably got, listen, I look back at these little babies back there. Those babies will mean nothing if I fall back in active addiction. That's the sad miserable body. Maybe at first they will, but then the guilt and the shame and Satan will just continue to use that and say, listen, just run away so you don't have to look at it. Run away so you don't have to see it. We're just going to keep using it into the ground. Right? Romans chapter 1 talks about this. Romans talks about all these heinous sins and all this stuff. And listen, the Bible says God just gave them over to a reprobate mind. Gave them over. How many of us have been in a reprobate mindset? Let me tell you what it is before you raise your hand. <laughs> right? So a reprobate mind, a reprobate mind, right? And I actually have it written down so I don't jack it up. But it basically means that you're unapproved. God's rejecting what's going on with you. It also means cast away. You'll be cast away. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, Paul says this. He says that I keep myself He's in recovery. He says, I keep myself, my body, which likes to sin and act out and act crazy, I keep it in subjection. I mean, I meet that stuff, submit to Christ. He says, otherwise, unless I preach to you, I'm being cast off. I'm being cast away. Mm -hmm. Right? And when I use that example a lot, that's like someone with a lot of clean time, worked some steps, did all the stuff, and then all of a sudden they stop kind of praying, and they stop doing the meetings, and the next thing you know, they're back out there using. How many people have you seen with some clean time go back out and use? And the devastation kicks in. All that stuff they were preaching all those years, all, that, all the people they were helping, they're gone, they're cast away. They're cast away. So it's the same word that's translated differently in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, when Paul says cast away. So reprobate also gets translated to cast away. All right? Everybody with me with on that? So it means God's rejecting what you're doing. God is not happy with how you're living. When it's talking about all those sins, and you can go back and read it for yourself in Romans, right? It's not talking about God's condemned them, because the end hasn't happened yet. So that's not a condemnation. God's not saying kill them or whatever. No, he's saying this is all this stuff that they're doing. 
I'm giving them all that they want to live like that. I'll let them have it. You want to live reprobate? You want to live wild? You want to be rejected? You want to go use? You can go use. I'll give you the permission. God's saying, listen, I'm not going to control you. You're not going to come to a Saturday service and all of a sudden I'm going to program your brain and now you're going to be a robot. Right? Sometimes it would be nicer if you just did that. Right? But he doesn't do that. He says, listen, you don't want to call your sponsor? You don't want to pray? You don't want to do these things? That's on you, man. Amen. But what does he say in chapter 2, in Romans chapter 2? Because here's the hit. He says, now he, now he goes, look at all these people. They're all jacked up. They're all getting out of addiction using. And then all of a sudden, in chapter 2, he turns around to the people in recovery. And he says, hey, who are you to judge them? Who do you think you are? Were you perfect? Are you kidding me? He's like, you're not perfect. You're falling short. You're doing all these things. Romans chapter 2, verse 4, he says, you despise the richness and the goodness and forbearance and long suffering, knowing that the goodness of God leadeth those into repentance. The goodness of God leadeth those into what? Repentance. Repentance, which means stop doing that thing. Turn. Go the other direction. It's the same thing as surrender. We talk about commitment, man, you gotta surrender, dude. We're not talking about just surrender to the oh, I got the disease. That's like saying, oh, Satan's real. Yeah, that's, uh, okay, that's an old brain to look at him. You know what I mean? He's struck on like a research monkey. But surrender to the solution. Surrender to the solution. What's the solution? Right here. It's, listen, it's what God's been putting in front of you. Right? If God keeps bringing you to a 12-step program, your whole life you've been in and out of this stuff, you've been hearing the message over and over and over, odds are, that's where God brought you to try to help you. He's saying, listen, just knock off the nonsense and listen to what I'm saying. So as peacekeepers, right, <laughs> we need to be loving and compassionate towards those people. Does that mean to those that are stuck out in the world, to those that don't know Jesus Christ, to those that are still in active addiction, right? We're, we're watching some of the things they do, and they're arrogant, they're egotistical, they're whatever, they're blind, they're freaking, whatever, whatever the thing is that they're doing, we need to have compassion and love on them. Does that mean we got to go pal around and hang out with them? No. Because remember what we talked about last week. You go to a lot of shop, you're going to get a what? Haircut. <laughs> Most likely, you're going to end up with a haircut. Right, Joss? That's what Joss told you to go there. Just for today, bro. Just for today. Right? So, we need to be careful of who we're surrounding ourselves with. You know, we need to be careful for our own protection. And the Bible teaches us that as well. It talks about sometimes in Jude uh, 23, it talks about like, Great, like sometimes saving someone from the fire, knowing that they're going to get caught in the fire, but it says hating the garment. Hating the garment of sin, basically. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's like, man, I hate the disease of addiction. It kills people. It robs them. It's killing my family permanently. Mm -hmm. Right? I get to see it. I, 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 I watch people die from this thing. I hate the disease. I don't hate the addict. I don't hate the addict because they're caught up. Just like the person in the world that doesn't have Jesus Christ, they're caught up, they don't know. That's right. They don't know. So I have to be the one who's showing the peace. I have to be the one that's loving. But I also have to set boundaries. I got papers all over the place. Where am I? <laughs> we got to set them boundaries, right? What about people who claim to be Christ followers? We've been talking about false apostles, right? People professing to know Jesus Christ. You ever find yourself getting angry when you see someone being a hypocrite? Mm -hmm. You ever get frustrated with that? Mm -hmm. Have you ever looked back in the mirror and thought, well, maybe I can be a hypocrite sometimes too? Yeah. <laughs> Most likely that's the case, right? But, but Christ is pretty clear about some stuff. Right? Make no, make no mistakes about it. It says, it says, when we read this last week in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul is talking about, I wrote you an epistle that says, keep away from fornicators. Everybody remember this? He said, I wrote you this letter to you people. I said, keep away from fornicators. And then he said, and then he corrected the stuff in verse 10. He said, well, here's what I was talking about. He's like, I wasn't talking about the fornicators and the covetousness and the, and the, and the railers and the extortioners in the world. He's like, because then you'd have to leave the world. You'd have to leave the planet. If I told you to stay away from those people. 
He says, I'm talking about anyone who professes to be a brother. Those ones. And then he goes on and says, don't even eat with them. Don't even sit down and have a meal with them. Put that evil person away from you is what it says in the Bible. Talking about a Christian. So again, just because someone knows those words, it doesn't mean, listen, we don't have to know them by their fruit. Second John says this. It says if, if someone doesn't keep this gospel, if someone's not talking about the things that we're talking about, and it's not coming from the word of God, it says don't even wish them God speed. Like don't even say good luck or God bless. He says otherwise you're a partaker of their evil deeds. That's in Second John. If anyone wants to ever go there and read that for yourself. We're actually going to go there. Real quick. I just want to show. <laughs> <laughs> I just show. Because it's, it's, we're gonna, because I want you to see what he's talking about. All right. Second John says this in verse nine. Second John, very small book towards the end of the Bible, uh, right before Revelation. We go to verse four. It says this real quick. We're gonna go to verse verse four. It says, "I rejoice greatly that I found my children walking in truth, as we have received a commandment from the Father. A commandment from who? The Father." The Father. Alright? Now notice it says the Father. And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a commandment unto thee, but that which you had from the beginning. Had it from when? The beginning. The beginning. This isn't new stuff. That we love one another, which is a summary of the? Commandments. The Ten Commandments. Variety. I'm in uh, Second John. Second John. Verse 6 now. And this is the love that we walk after his commandments. We do what? Walk after his commandments. We walk after his commandments. Remember when, it just, when we just talked about don't give a false witness against the neighbor. That's a commandment from God. That means don't be gossiping. Then he goes on to say, this is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning that you should walk in. He goes on to say a couple of things about deceivers, right? Which is a short book. It says, For many deceivers have entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. And I'm going to add this too, right? Is that if someone's professing Jesus Christ and not living <coughs> Christ's life, they're denying Christ. If I say I'm walking with Jesus Christ and my life isn't reflecting that, not perfectly, family, right? I'm talking about perfection here. I'm talking about I'm striving towards that. So yeah, I might be falling short in an area for a while, but I'm continuously repenting and I'm trying to get back on track, right? Some people aren't trying to get back on track. They're completely deceived, they're completely out the door on their doctrines, and, 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 they, and they're not repenting of it at all. They think they're 100% right. They think they're 100% right to judge you in the name of Jesus Christ and all this stuff, and it's nuts. Goes on to say this in verse 9, it says, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. Has not who? God. Just so you didn't think it was just me making that stuff up. Alright? So you can say Jesus Christ all day long, but if you're not in the doctrine of Christ, you have not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. Now here's the hit. Okay? It says here in verse 10, If there come to you anyone and bring not this doctrine, what doctrine? We just talked about it in, 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 in verses 4 and 6. The commandments, keeping love, doing the doctrine of Christ. If they're not doing that, right, these false believers, it says, if anyone come not, bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is a partaker of his evil deeds. So you can't co-sign the nonsense. You can't co-sign the nonsense. And again, just to kind of put it back in the context with us, it's like someone's coming around here, they're not really truly recovering and all this stuff. Like, we got to support them and love them up. But we have to have healthy boundaries. Amen? Amen. 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 Alright, we're going to read something heavy duty and we're going to come into a conclusion. So I'm looking around, looking for people saying it's high up in there. So let's go to Matthew. <laughs> we're going to turn to the book of Matthew. We've got a few more verses and we're going to wrap this up. We're going to bring it home. Bring it home. Matthew chapter 10. We're going to read 34 through 42. This is Jesus Christ talking. This is in the gospel. Gospel Matthew. Now here's a, here's a, here's a curve. Also, right? Think not that I've come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. Oh wait a second. We're just talking about peace. 
So Jesus just put the script on us, right? But when Jesus came here, he didn't come here to, to bring peace and all this other stuff. He came here to bring a sword. Now let's see what he's talking about. For I have come to set a man of variance against his father, and the daughter against the mother, and the daughter against daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. So what is he talking about? He's talking about when we start getting into a relationship with him, other people aren't going to be hearing it. I don't know if anyone's gone, gone home and said, hey, you know, hey, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I found Jesus Christ and I'm going to stop following him and stuff like that. And they look at it and they're like, what? Yeah, they're like, come on, Dad, <laughs> right? Nonsense. Listen, some people get so mad, they want nothing to do with you. If you stay consistent with it, they'll stop wanting nothing to do with you. Oh, I don't even want to get in so-and-so's car. All they listen to is Christian music, right? <laughs> Hey, we get in the car, they just want to pray. I got time for that. People get offended. Listen, to start getting mad. Jesus said, listen, this is what's going to start happening in your life. He goes on to say this. He says, if he that loveth the father or mother, check it out. You love the father or mother? More than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He that taketh not his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. So I have to be willing to stand my ground. So I'm talking about the boundaries. I have to be willing to stand my ground and say, no, listen, I'm with Jesus Christ. You can judge it. You can talk about it negatively or whatever you want to do. But keep that stuff to yourself. Don't bring it around me. I don't care if you're a mother, father, daughter, sister, brother, best friend, cousin, uncle, third cousin, fourth cousin, CEO, whatever you want. It doesn't matter. Because my allegiance needs to be with Christ. And if I don't love Christ enough to stand for him, he says, I'm going to deny you. I, you can't say that stuff to me. You can't say you're wrong with me and you're not wrong with me. Right? Goes on and goes on. He said, he that finds his life shall lose it. And he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. He that receiveth you receiveth me. And he that receiveth, uh, he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me, which is God. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. Whoever shall give a cup to drink unto one of these little ones, a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. So there's another emphasis of how much we need to be supporting each other. We're living in a fallen world, a, a world that... that People are hating Jesus Christ. Listen, why do you think so many people in the United States decide to turn away from God and Jesus Christ? Hypocrites. So many hypocrites. There's so many people claiming Jesus Christ that aren't living in Christ life. So many of them. Professing to know Jesus, but don't really know him. And teaching people falseness. And God's not happy about it. There's some structure in God's word. 1 Corinthians 7.15, 1 Corinthians 7.15, we're going to bang out some scriptures, and like I said, we're going to wrap it up. 1 Corinthians 7.15 says this, But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not in a bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. So listen, and it's really talking about marriage and stuff right here, but it's also talking about anybody. If someone's not receiving this, if they're not hearing it, they're saying, listen, Scotty, I don't want to hear it no more. You've been talking about Jesus Christ, blah, blah, blah. I'm all set. God said, that's fine, man. Be on your way. The heart and peace. They don't want to hear it. They don't have to. They don't have to hear it. It's not going to force us on over anything. God has to be first in our lives no matter what. We don't have to be nasty about it. We don't have to be rude about it. We can be loving. That includes anybody, man. False believer, non-believer, mother, father, sister, daughter, brother, whatever, doesn't matter. Matthew uh, chapter 19, verse 29. It says that everyone that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. Everlasting life. This is the promises of God. Our concluding scriptures are going to be, again, in Matthew. And we can turn there. 
Because this is this is the ultimate hit of this whole message. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. And we read this, we said this in the morning. We didn't read it. Matthew 5, verse 9 says this. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 5. And then we're going to conclude in Matthew 18, verse 3. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, but they shall be called the children of God. The what? Children of God. Just the peacemakers. Now let's shoot over to Matthew 18, 3. Anybody want to read this out loud for us? You've got to read it really loud. <clears throat> and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. What shall not happen? If you don't become like a what? Little child. A little child. Verse 9 of chapter 5 says, The peacekeepers, blessed are the peacekeepers, for they shall be called the children of God. Right? So if we're a peacekeeper, we're we'll called the children of God. If we're children of God, we enter into the kingdom of heaven. Anyone see that? Yep. So we've got to strive to be a peacekeeper today. Strive to keep the peace. In a loving, Christ-like way. And if you, can, if, you, if you run into a situation and you're like, man, how do I do this right now? <coughs> Call another addict. Ask for help. <laughs> Call Lifeline. Hey, man, I don't know what to do. Listen, I just came out with the church piece at the Serenity Center. A really good message. Half hour later, so much soldiers. Ticked me right off, right? And I don't know how to respond to this. Listen, call a friend. Talk to somebody. Because I'll tell you right now, the enemy's going to swoop in and try to destroy your peace. Mm -hmm. He's going to come in in all kinds of different shapes and forms. It might come into a phone call back home, hey, oh, hey, ma, I just went to this thing, and you know, they were talking about this, and I really could understand that I could relate to it, and they could say, what is it? Oh, it's, uh, you know, we're talking about the, the Bible, right? <laughs> you kidding me? They're trying to drive that nonsense into you up there? That's craziness. You know? Stay firm in your faith. Stay firm in your relationship with Jesus Christ. All right, we do have a closing song today. Praise God for that. Now we going to organize that. And while she does, we're going to end in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for this, for this day. Thank you, Father, for your message. And, um, and I just ask you, God, to help us all, myself and all of us, including God, to live in peace today, to think about and meditate on your word, the Bible. And to go back and to reread these verses and to, and to put them together with other verses as well. Because there's quite a few things that we didn't cover. Um, there's other verses, Father. But we need to be clear about your word in the Bible, God. Continue to stay hungry and thirsty for more of your knowledge in your word. And to communicate and, and to stay together with other believers, Father. So I just pray, pray for a blessing on everyone that's here today and watching online, God. That you just protect our minds, protect our hearts, God. And help us to just remember to just keep the peace with everyone around us and within ourselves. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Alright, so we'll stand for this last song. And, uh, Second song in the chat. Second song on the chat.